Marnie Batista. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Welcome to Jewish Money Matters. I'm excited to be here very much so. Oh my gosh. I already bragged about you in the introduction, but you are the <laughs> founder of the Institute of Living Courageously and so much of our relationship with money and living courageously, they just go hand in hand. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun here today. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's yeah. Like, yes. I mean, I just can't wait for the questions that you're going to ask me. <laughs> well, yeah, we're going to have a lot to unpack, but actually before we even get to the money part, I want to talk about when I read about your work and I look at what you've been doing in the Institute of Living Courageously and with your coaching, with your writing, you really are helping your students succeed, not just in their relationships, not just in their love life, but really it's, it's, it's all encompassing. It's their career. It's so many other areas. And as I noted in your work and in your bio that st stood out to me was that it all really points out uh, points, it really points to the same in the same direction, which is what you call creating a deeply meaningful and fulfilling life. And you mentioned offline to me that you're also working on a new book that kind of centers around this idea of li living, living a meaningful life, which maybe we'll touch upon a little bit later. So why don't we get started before we dive into the book, before we dive into money Let's dive into this idea of living a meaningful life because it seems to be a core pillar of your work, of your service to others. Where did that desire of un unraveling this idea of meaning in life and helping people in this area come from? What, what was that impetus? Well, I think that in my own story, I think that I was sort of raised in a way whereby creating a, a life of, of meaning, and I'm using air quotes, is to create success in the traditional way. Mm -hmm. And it, it had to look a certain way. And so I did my very best uh, to create that, you know, whether it was how I functioned as a student in school, uh, trying to be the good girl or the, the favorite child to, um, you know, who I ended up marrying, my first husband, you know, I thought he fit into this box of what I thought was important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't really making choices based on really my highest self or my most divine self. Um, I was just doing kind of following the programming. And when that sort of blew up uh, after 17 years of marriage and really starting to get back to the central question of um, instead of asking sort of like, why is this happening to me? <laughs> like from a sort of victim -y place, like why is this happening to me? You know, like I followed the rules. Um, I remember this moment where I, I was doing some pretty deep work and I had this moment with like God and I was just sort of like, why, why did you turn your back on me? Mm. And the, this deep spiritual moment was like, I never left you. Why did you turn your back on me? And that was sort of like sent me on this path of like, well, if I want to live a life like in like peace and joy and really feel like I'm being the person that I was designed to be uniquely me, mm -hmm. then what's the journey I want to go on to get the most aligned with like my divine self? Because that I realized is what creates meaning. And mm -hmm. for a lot of us, those shoulds aren't really in alignment with that. They're just programmed. Yeah. Yeah. But what you, what you just described sounds so familiar familiar. I don't know if it has to do with growing up in the eighties. I have no idea. There, <laughs> exactly. was, <laughs> there was a Pretty lot much. of that. Um, so as you're trying to answer these questions for yourself, then this becomes also a calling, a service to others. How does that transition happen into your, per from your personal journey into this is something I need to give over to others? Well, it's so interesting because, um, so I got divorced and then I ended up, you know, sort of being in a relationship with, uh, I always say like the same guy with a different face. Oh, that yeah. Failed. And that happens so often, right? It's right. And then that failed. Uh, and then I started sort of being on this more right path. And the irony is that I was, uh, 
dating and single. And I wanted to write a dating book. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was talking to people about writing this dating book and I had, you know, had all these, I was going to be kind of like sarcastic and funny, but also insightful. And this person said to me, well, you know, a book is not a business. You, you have to build like this platform. You, it has to, it has to be something more. And at that time I was like, well, what does that even mean? Like, what's a platform? Is that a shoe? I mean, like, and they were like, No, it's this bigger thing. And then I was doing personal development work as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. And I was in this group and I was chatting to this guy about like, I wanted, like, I have this vision to like help people through this book and this journey. And I love helping people in this volunteer sense. And it suddenly just, it was like in my kitchen and like the lights went off and I was like, wait, I'm meant to help people figure out how to create healthy relationships from this place of self-worth and alignment to truth. And what I would teach people to do was like the date, once they got their self-worth, the dating relationship part with a strategy kind of worked itself out. Then it became really clear, like once you do this in one area of your life, how can you then create your whole life to look like this? And so that was really the impetus of like, I suffered so that I could help others to not suffer. Mm, yeah. 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 It's what they say as like the, the way and what you said before is kind of that saying that goes that the way you do anything is how you do everything. Right. <laughs> totally. And what you, what you learn is what you are meant to teach. And I'd always wanted to be a teacher and I was a teacher for a while. I taught like a developmental kindergarten at a Jewish nursery school. Um, and uh, I used to say like, oh, this is my exact right place I'm supposed to be because where else can you go to work where people will say, I love you every day, right? Those little kids would sit and say, I love you. Yeah. Um, and now I get to do that with adults and they still express that. And it's just beautiful to be in that experience. Let's talk about money because when we talk about meaning, um, meaning and money, sometimes when we say those two words in the same sentence, there's a little bit of a shock wave, like there's that um, feeling like these should be opposing concepts, or they're mutually exclusive. And I, and I'm, sh- I, I have a feeling you're of the same mindset that I propose that while living a life of meaning has nothing to do with how much you acquire, or how much, uh, you know, how much you accumulate per se, the money that you do have in the bank, the money that you are blessed with can and will help you live a life of meaning. It will facilitate that process if you allow it to. But first we have to be really clear on the meaning, on the life that we want to design for ourselves, right? So why don't we dive into that? Because again, I think this gets very misconstrued and it can be really confusing for people and almost have has like a negative light. And I think you probably can illuminate a little bit um, these ideas. Yeah. So oh, I love this question. So I, I'm going to kind of reverse engineer this into the, this, and this is part of um, my book, A Meaningful Life. But there are these seven questions that the, the story goes in the Torah, you know, you reach the pearly gates and you get asked these seven questions as you leave, uh, live a meaningful life. And it's really interesting. The first question, you know, according to the stories are um, like, uh, how did you show up in business? Business, yeah. Right. And so business, you know, is you'd think, oh, well, so you know, God, divine universe, whatever is saying, did you make a lot of money? Um, and that's actually not what it's about. It's really about did you if you were ethical and you lived according to your values and really who you are, even when it comes to money. Yes. Because money is this thing that we have scarcity and we um you know, like, gosh, when someone passes away, you could just see everyone's reactions to money, the true colors around money and all those things will come out. Right. And so the, the, the story sort of goes like, if you can still do that and, and be in your values around money, then you will have lived a meaningful life, which to me means that you place like who you are and your values as the primary motivator. And that if you live according to that way, like I always think about like, I want my abundance to be a reflection of me living in my essential self of my divine self of being true to who I am of living according to my values. Um, 
And so it's the like, it's the, um, you know, it's like counterintuitive, right? It's really that, that, ref- that tangible cash money really comes in my experience from really being motivated by wanting to be me and to make that impact or to do what I'm meant to do in the right. world, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love that. I was just talking about this idea of how business is such a holy endeavor because really you're utilizing the God-given talents, those inner um, resources and the external resources, your circumstances, like in your case, the, ch- the challenge, right? Those external resources that God gives you in the form of challenges or celebrations, all of it, you package it for the service of others, right? And, and, and in that partnership, like you've given me this, now I utilize it to serve others with this product, this service, this serve, this need, this void in the market. Then there's an, a consequential exchange. That's such a beautiful exchange. Somebody values that, and they give you something called money. And, and then you continue that partnership by transferring that money to those who need it. One of them being yourself and then the other people who need it around you. So it's just, it really is a holy endeavor, which goes back to this Talmudic question that you pose about, you know, when we leave this world, they will ask us, how did you behave in business? Were, were you in alignment with those core values, those core principles? And Thankfully, we have a tradition that teaches us how to do that. Um, so I love how you address that. So when when you're working with other women, now that we're on this topic of the confusion, what are some of the confusing messages or negative beliefs or things that you're seeing women have mm-hmm. to overcome? And and you know sometimes there are, there are even patterns maybe you have been seeing over time. Yeah, it's so fun. So we just launched this, um, this process, live life on your terms. And at the beginning, people are unpacking all these like shoulds. Mm. Um, and, um, they they go from like, um, uh, work is hard. Yeah. Um, you know, like, um, <laughs> sounds again, like yeah. the nineties. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Work is hard. Um, I need to, if I'm, if I put myself there for you, um, above myself, then you will reward me with promotion, money, uh, you know, elevation, some sort of like thing, which people think will give them meaning and fulfillment. Um, the other things that really come out are like, I'm not capable, right? Or there's so many I can't, right? Like what I really want to do is this, but I'm not capable or I'm not enough. Mm-hmm. Or if I can't do it perfectly, um, then like, why bother? Um, there's this, and I want to think of the the author and I can't think of her last name, but her first name is Reshma. I'll look it up. Um, she wrote this book called, um, brave, not perfect. Mm. Um, she founded this organization, girls who code. Um, Mm. and she talks about in her book about how, as women, we get programmed, um, that if we're not perfect or the best at it, then we start to not try to do things because, because we have to be the best. And so there's so many women that I work with that aren't even, exploring what is resonant, like what their heart really longs for their soul, because they're afraid that they don't know how to do it perfectly. Uh, And so they don't even, they don't even try. And then they end up pretzeling themselves into this like pre um, sort of preconceived social norms of what life is supposed to look like. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, I, 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 oh my gosh, I can relate to so many of the, these when, you know, in my early twenties and maybe even, yeah, yeah, definitely my twenties. Um, there's another big one here. I don't know if you've noticed it, but it, and I, I don't know if you even dealt with it yourself, but I know I did. I've talked about it on the show, this idea of, and again, it's very subtle because many of us were conditioned to become quote unquote independent women, assertive right. women, go-getters, yeah. right? And yet I know that for many of us, there was this subtle message that at the end of the day, Prince Charming is coming. And so, you know, like when it comes to your money, give it your all but and your career, but Prince Charming is coming. And so there's a little bit of the syndrome of burying our head under the sand and just 
praying for Prince Charming to show up and save me out of this situation because well, I, I don't want to deal with it. Well, I think there's two versions of that because yeah. I have a lot. Of, yeah. Well, so there's that one. Prince Charming is going to rescue me. And then I have this whole other set of women, whether like if they're immigrants from different cultures or they were just raised by women who um, were uh, uh, left disempowered through relationship. There's mm-hmm. the other thing, which is like, um, you better take care of yourself because no, ma- you can't rely on a man. Or I had oh a client my. whose mom told her, um, you know, you're just, let's just be honest. You're not really that beautiful. And so you better be really smart and do really well, you know? And so I think that there's like the, the group that's like, oh, you know, this guy, this handsome prince will rescue me very like Disney-esque. And then there's the other that are like, don't ever rely on a man because um, you'll get you know, abandoned, yeah. left, brokenhearted. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how do people work through these things? I mean, again, this whole, this affects us on a financial level. It affects the type of relationship we're, relationships we get, we get ourselves into. I mean, there's so much unpacking that has to happen um, in, in, in the coaching process. Well, yeah. So the, the process that we sort of talk about is a four, four prong sort of approach, which is reveal, release, rejuvenate, and then resource. And so the first thing that has to happen is you have to reveal these unconscious patterns. And I think mm-hmm. the shoulds, um, there are so many that we don't even realize that we have. Um, and, and I will say that there are so many women of all ages, even like, um, I've had women that are saying like, um, I can't retire until I have X amount of years at this thing, or I have this amount of money. And what I find, um, a lot of the times is that women aren't really getting the help to look at their money to actually find out if they have choices. Um, and that there's so many more choices that they have if they ask the right questions and look at their money in the right way. Because they just feel like, well, I can't retire till I can barely walk, (laughs) you know, so those, those sort of things can happen. So you have to reveal what are all the shoulds and the beliefs. And then when you're looking at how do I release it? One thing that I just want everyone to sort of take away is your, your awareness or your knowledge or your understanding of where stuff comes from does not equate healing and transformation. Hmm. Right. We have to actually rewire those neural grooves that are also generational. I mean, talk about generational. Mo- I, I, I could go on and on about the generational money stories I've had to let go of. Um, so we have to rewire our brain, you know, um, and then you have to rejuvenate, which means that then you have to actually get in, con- in connection with who are who am I really? What am I at my essential self? And come up with like new skills, new paradigms, new belief systems, right? And create new neural pathways. Right. And then the last piece is resource. And I think this is really important because resource to me is being able to connect back into our spiritual self. Mm to provide that grounding and center to who we really are and our divine connection and being grounded to that as a way to create resilience when the challenges of life and the tests of life come through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is when we so easily can fall back into those old patterns, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, life is, they say like pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional, right? So how are you going to, how are you going to handle the universal uh, soul tests? (laughs) <laughs> so, so now that you, and, and, and by the way, and I feel like sometimes those soul tests, it's like, it's God sending the message to see, are you really committed to this process of, yes, let uh, me just, I, let me just, let me just poke you again to see what's your level of commitment to change here, because I know you can do it, but you just gotta, I gotta push you. And sometimes we just miss it. And we just like go back instead of like understanding that it's just part of the process. You're going to get tested. (laughs) Well, and that's why really like our mission is living your courageous life, because that is when the rubber meets the road, right? That's when you really have to be courageous. That's when you make the decision to live to your values versus, you know, taking the money or selling your soul for a job that isn't really right or whatever it is doing the right thing. And that's why courage is like the, the thread through all those phases. 
Yeah. Yeah. So now that you mentioned um, the money stories that you yourself had to unpack and had to get rid of, you had to rewire, give us, give us some insight into what those were. What were those types of money stories Uh that you internalized as a child? So I just, it's really interesting because it was just over the summer. I, um, we did this radical living challenge. My husband and I lived in a 36 foot RV for 30, um, 35 days. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we were in this little space and, uh, we're doing, uh, doing a lot of uh, things and, and there we had to, had to cancel an event. Like I was getting a life challenge and I realized that I had this. I have to ask Marnie, why in the world did you guys lock yourselves up in an RV for 30 something days? (laughs) Well, because actually we're, we're in this process of designing our life as empty nesters. And we, we found out that all our peak experiences, we do this annual planning every year. And last year at this time, we realized that all our peak experiences last year and over the years were in new and novel experiences in nature. Mm. And we're like, we asked, we were doing life design. We asked, how might we create new and novel experiences while also maintaining our ability to have work and a healthy lifestyle and, you know, financial security and all those sorts of things. And so we wanted to run an experiment. So we lived in this RV. And so I was, um, I was, you know, really realizing that I was having the scarcity come up and a lot of fear. And, um, and I was like, where's this coming from? And I remembered, well, first of all, it goes back generations, but my initial moment was I, when I was like 10 or 11 years old, my dad had a 125, um, year old family business yeah. started in the 18, like hundreds, mm-hmm. right. When my ancestors came from uh, Russia and Poland, And he had decided to leave that business because he was not able to really be who he wanted to be, which was to be creative and to be more of a risk taker. And he wasn't being acknowledged in that family system. So he quit. So he comes in, I'm sitting there like watching the Brady Bunch or whatever it was. And he's like, I quit. And my first words out of my mouth to him were, are we going to be poor? Wow. And my little 10 year old self felt unsafe. And, um, and when I was researching, um, my family history for my book, I uncovered a lot of, my dad had written a blog and there were all these home movies and all of these things that I was able to kind of dig up. And my dad grew up like in New York and he tells these stories about how, you know, it was like the dead of winter freezing. And he was taught by his grandfather, you know, you don't turn on the heat, you just get more blankets. Right. And so I was like, wow. Um, and I had this visualization. So what I did was I, I wrote a lot of journaling and I, I did all of this um, work to kind of reveal. And I did this release experience. And for me, release is often really physical. Mm-hmm. So I was boxing. Right. And I was punch, hitting this punching bag and I was in this meditative state. And I had this vision of my ancestors saying to me, we walk down the road so that you don't have to, we suffered through, um, you know, the, the, the great depression through the panic of, um, uh, 1918, like we did all that and we went through that. So you don't have to, you can release this generational story. I, it was amazing. Y'all. I, I just saw them all like their images from all those black and white photos. And they were like, just, we did this for you. Don't Mm -hmm. carry it. Um, and then I had this thing that I had written out and I, and I was at this little campsite and it was early in the morning and I had a cup of coffee and I, I set a little fire in the little, you know, where you do the campfires and I, I burned the journaling and I just said, my commitment is to not leave a legacy of scarcity and fear. Wow. Um, and that was like, that was a really profound moment. Cause I don't want to leave that to my kids or the future generations. Right, 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 right. I, thought, I got chills because so many of us are carrying that generational trauma, whether it be, the, you know, immigration from Russia or the Holocaust, or there's just so much here that we need to let go of. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Because, because, and that's what I think it is. It's, it's, they, they suffered for us and they went through that. And I know that I want to be a good ancestor and I want to share the wisdom that I've learned. And if I could, you know, sit with them all under a tree and have them share their stories with me, they would say like, 
at the end, a meaningful life is about, about love and connection and fulfillment and purpose. And we, we, we're sharing that with you. We did it. So be different. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you share that with us. Let's go back to you building your business because now that we've gotten so intimate, I am sure. Well, first of all, you and I know that being an entrepreneur, building a business is like personal growth on steroids. I don't yes, think there's anything is. like it. Maybe parenting. Yeah, yeah parenting. Yeah, okay. Parenting, yeah. Right. Um, so you know, people think I don't know what people think, but but just for the record, everybody, it is personal growth on steroids. It's like yeah. <laughs> Yeah. If you don't want to embark on a personal growth journey, just don't be a entrepreneur. <laughs> just get a job, a nine to five. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. so so what I'm getting at it, I, I can only imagine that through the last decade, as you've built your business, as you've pivoted, as we all do within the business, and it gets more nuanced and there's scale, you scale and you grow, there has there have to have been some so many layers of um shedding of these money stories or of, of, of a how moments of things that I need to push myself in this direction. And I see a block, like take us down that path because business, again, at the end of the day, a business has to make money. So we're always facing these notions that we're carrying around about money as we're trying to scale and as we're trying to grow. So what have been some of those challenges that you've, that you've been faced with and these demons that you've looked in the eye and said, Oh, here I am, Marnie. (laughs) Well, number one was like around sales and enrolling. And, and, you know, I, I'm a really good student and I strive to be the perfect student. That was my old way. And so I was, you know, I would, I would get these mentors, um, and I would pay a lot of money to get these mentors and I would just do whatever they said. And a lot of the time I would do it quote unquote, perfectly. And it wasn't working. Mm. And I was like, what's wrong with me? And like, why am I not getting this? And I would work harder and I would strive more and I'd work more hours. And I remember I had this one moment where I was talking to the mentor and there was like a team of them, you know, cause I invested at the highest level and all these <laughs> things. And they were like, um, you know, you must be doing it wrong. Like there's, you're, you're wrong. Basically. It was basically, I felt very shamed. Right. And I, I had done every exercise and crossed every T and dotted every I. And I had this spiritual awakening where I was like, stop doing what other people do because they're not you. It's time for you. Can we like bold and caps, neon flashlight? Yeah. And I was like, I need to do me. And those strategies don't work because they're not authentic for me. In some cases, they're not really in alignment with my beliefs. Um, Their motive, their core motivation is just money um, and not service. Right. Um, and I was like, oh my God. And it was, I'd like had to literally like shed everything. I like, I was like, I'm not going to get a mentor in the same way. I'm going to get off of all these groups. I'm going to unsubscribe from all these lists. Like I need to stop having comparison to spare and thinking that the answer is outside of me. And so the minute I started creating from myself, my essential self, um, I was able to find the essential self of my business Mm. and start creating from that space. And, um, that was a huge, huge moment. And, and then it was like scaling and investing and building team, you know? And so when you build to scale and then the business cycles of life show you a challenge moment, like I just was like, constrict, constrict, we cut everything, fire everyone. I was like, no, but I'm in service to also to these people and their lives. And, I'm just constantly having to do this, this work and, and resourcing to my purpose. I love that. It really, it really does go back to a business is about serving. And if we always go back to that, what is the best way that I can show up to be of service? What is my next step that I need to do to be who I am for the market in service of what the market needs? Right. And that has, and that also applies to showing up for our team. Right. It's uh, again, personal growth on 
steroids. It, it is. And, and what I've really learned this year in 2021, um, was really what, and it's been a huge thing, like in, to increase productivity and performance, to have my leadership have like the right kind of coaching to connect to themselves and be in their most essential self, which mm-hmm. has nothing to do with like work product really per se, but really investing in my team um, to, to be who they're meant to be was at first I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. Right. Like I'm not a fortune 500 company. I don't have like all these resources to invest in coaching for my leadership, executive coaching for my leadership. And I did it. And it, it, it's made just like a massive difference in the, the success of our business. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. Wow. That's amazing. Let's go back to the early days when you're, cause now we're at this point where, you know, we've scaled, we have a team, we're even investing in our team, but those early days after the divorce, um, where probably there was so much in terms of the money blocks and oh gosh, the scarcity yeah. coming up and you're post divorce and you're trying to do something really aspirational, really ambitious. And, you know, you want to serve and you're not wired like that. Yeah. <laughs> so how, what was going on financially and how, how did that, you know, how did that play itself out? Oh my gosh. Well, so I was married for 17 years, um, to a guy who had serious money issues. I'm going to call them money issues. So he believed that spending money creates love. So Mm -hmm. as a nice Jewish girl who got, who grew up that way, I was like, I'll sign up for that. (laughs) Buy me stuff. (laughs) Buy So I had this lavish, whatever, uh, lived in LA, you know, all of these sorts of things that weren't really making me happy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lots of things. Um, And when I got divorced, um, you know, I had some alimony and things like that, but I was in denial. I was not managing my money. I had never really paid bills. I hadn't made decisions about the, I was just, it was so old school. Um, and, uh, I ended up like hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Mm. This is a great story for your show. I had my first daughter as bat mitzvah. And I had this idea of what it was supposed to look like in Los Angeles. And I remember I had hired this like bookkeeper person to like kind of help me with some stuff. And I was screaming at her on the phone. I was like, find me another credit card. (laughs) She was like, you're at your limit. I was like, I need to hire this caterer. And, you know, and I literally went into debt to have this glitzy, glammy bat mitzvah. So so when I started my business, I was in debt um, and I wanted to uh, have a website. And I remember um, thinking like, I, I don't have any more credit. I can't do this website. I don't know how to do it myself. This was, of course, like 12, 13 years ago. And I'll never forget. I like talked to this person and she was like, well, what if there was a way, what are, what could it be if it were possible? Like, can you begin to open your mind to the fact that it's possible you could do this? Mm. And I was like, what does that even mean? So I kind of thought about it. And two days later, I got this call from my dad. And this was like right after my mom had died. And he was like, this is crazy, but I didn't know your mom had this account and she left you like $50,000. And I was like, you're kidding me. And so I decided to take a portion of that and build my website. And that was like, that was my seed money for my company. Mm -hmm. And that was when I just actually decided to um, become financially responsible. And I read every single money book that you could. And I got on a debt reduction plan and I started my business and um, got out of debt and then went from like zero to building wealth. Yeah. I love that. I thank you for sharing that. I love the honesty and I could so totally, totally relate. And, and again, the, the, this, what you just described contrasts so much the earlier part of our conversation where we were talking about being in alignment with our values. Who do we want to live? Right. It's like this woman who's just 
on autopilot because this is the way the bat mitzvah needs to look oh because this is the way it's always been done. This is the way everybody in my world does it. This is the way it is. It's like, there was never a process of, well, who am I? What, what do I really want to teach my daughter? What, what, what kind of celebration do I want? You know, like none of that. None of that. We're, none none master, of that. we're like literally on an autopilot but, button. No, a hundred percent. What's crazy is I grew up in Iowa, like in the, you know, seventies and eighties. Right. And so I, I didn't grow up in Los Angeles, but like what I learned is like, you have an ice carving or whatever at your bot mitzvah. <laughs> You know, like you're going to have the one and only ice carving in rural Iowa because that's what we do. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it was um, and it was funny then, you know, having um, the third daughter's bat mitzvah as I sort of went through my journey and then planning my own wedding when I remarried again. It's just really interesting. But it, it money, it impacts every single thing. And and really getting out of the shoulds is like terrifying and also so sa- soul satisfying. Oh, I love that. So soul satisfying. Love that idea. And so let's, let's talk about now that you wish you've shared your journey, your clients, your students, the listeners in the audience, when we are dating, when we're in a relationship, um, what are some of the things that we need to be doing better? And perhaps we could split it. So maybe it's a different process. Maybe there's a different, there's nuances to when you're dating and when you're already in a relationship and you're uniting your finances, what are the things that you're seeing that you're telling your, your clients, listen, when it comes to the area of money, this is what you need to be talking about. This is how you need to be structuring things. What, are, what, what is your take on this? Well, so first of all, <clears throat> Going back to shoulds, uh, so many of the women that I work with of all ages have so many shoulds around a partner and money, mm-hmm, right? Like, and like um, he needs, and some of my clients earn a ton of money and they're like, he needs to earn as much as me. He needs, needs to earn more than me. Um, he needs to have zero debt. He needs mm-hmm. to, you know, he needs to have X, the older, he needs to have X amount of retirement. Like they have rules about it. Um, and so what I help them do is really get clear on what their core values are around um, really what they need in a relationship. And for some, the money piece is really true and core to like what they really need and believe. And for others, it's totally programmed. Uh-huh. Um, so I have a client who is super successful, CFO of like a major uh, company, corporate corporate gigs. Um, and she will happily, and she's been on my podcast and she's talked about how, like the journey I went on to make $400,000 a year to find my perfect soulmate who makes $40,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Right. And why her partner now in four years is like her perfect guy. She was like, I would have totally missed that, missed it completely. Um, and so like, And I had another client who ended up, she got really clear, like she wanted her partner to have um, a certain amount of uh, retirement and this, and it was really interesting because she had a value around family, but she had a value around this money piece. And in the end, he had invested a lot of his retirement when he got divorced to put his adult or his you know children through college and graduate school. And he'd used a lot of the retirement between that and alimony and you know, buying his wife out of the house, ex-wife out of the house. He didn't have much left. Mm-hmm. And she was like, I don't know, like that's a, he made a bad decision. He should have had his kids get get financial aid. He shouldn't have paid for it. And she really had to grapple with, which is more more important, that value that he had as a dad and family or money. And in the end, she authentically chose money and broke up with him after a couple of years uh, because she couldn't be in acceptance around it. So I'm telling you both versions because there is no right answer, right? You have to decide for yourself and get clear on what actually are the values that you want as your primary core things in your relationship. And there, there is no, there is no right answer. It's what's right for you and really um, in alignment with your truth. So how does one get clear on those values? Cause I think this is the core at, at the essence. You've just said it, like you have to go through that process. What does that process look like? Again, values is so elusive for people. We just go through life 
And we never get very few of us actually sit down and think about this. How does a person uncover what their real values are? Well, this is like a whole process we walk our clients through. And it's literally one of the hardest pieces that people have so much resistance to because they have so many rules. So the first, so I, I, I will give you like the most important pieces to start. And that one thing is like, you can Google values, you know, you can Google it and print it out and circle, which ones, you know, that you think are really um, <laughs> relevant to you as a starting point. Cause I think that's a warm up. Cause when you look at a list of 50, you're like, well, I care about them all. Do I, it just starts you asking questions. So that's number one. Number two is, um, think about this. If you talking about legacy, if you were going to pass down five core values to mm -hmm either your children or children that you know, or just to make a mark in the world, what would those five things be? And then look at um, a few successful parts, keyword parts of relationships you admire. You might not admire all the parts of the relationship, but the pieces that you admire, what are the values that those two people really demonstrate that resonates with you? So it might be they're playful um, or they are respectful or whatever it is. And so you kind of like accumulate all of these, this data and you, you and do this over like about a week and put it out in front of you and then be like, wow, I get to choose five. Mm -hmm. Which are your core five values? So those are what we call non-negotiable. Those are right. deal breakers. And what I will tell you is you do get, you can have 50 things on your wish list and you might get those five plus a bunch on your wish list, but you'll never get all 105. Mm -hmm. One person I'm here to tell you that right now. Yeah. So you got to be empowered to make a choice and start, start there and whittle it down. And it is a, it, that is a spiritual exercise too, mm -hmm. because it allows you to say like, these are the things I care about. These are the five fights I don't want to have. And I'm willing to work through the others, the, the Gottman Institute, which is like a leading researcher on relationships says 69% of, of a couple's problems are perpetual. Okay. So that means you're going to constantly be negotiating, working through having conflict, working through conflict. Okay. So, you know, you got 69%. What's the other percent that you are like, this is something we're not going to have to worry about. Those will end up being your non-negotiables. I love, I love how you broke that down for us. Let's go to living courageously in the financial sense, because you talked about making those brave choices of taking part of the $50,000 windfall that you weren't expecting it and investing in, in the dream of this new and new business, right? Um, yeah. You talked about getting yourself out of debt. Those were, those are courageous moves. They go against the tide. They go against the norm. I'm not sure our best friend would have approved. We probably didn't tell them, <laughs> right? Um, what are some financially courageous things that people just to plant the seed? Like, you know, there are brave things that you're capable of doing that you, you know, you could look as options. What are some courageous financial moves in your estimation? Well, I think like understanding the debt, the, the, the difference between like um, consumer debt and investing mm -hmm. in like yourself or yeah. a way to get out of a pain or a problem. So what I knew that when I was investing in my business, that was a long-term investment, but, you know, buying a handbag or, you know, going on a trip to whatever and staying at this hotel, that was just to do it because, I wanted everyone to think I'm like on Instagram that I'm staying at a nice hotel. Right. Mm -hmm. So those are two really distinctions. So being brave to say, um, I can have a certain kind of debt and feel good about it because it's a long-term investment. So that's number one. I think the other thing is, um, when you get clear on what makes life meaningful and break it down to what's essential. Mm. Um, when I was in my early days of like getting out of debt and, you know, again, a very affluent community and my kids going to this school and all of these things, um, and being like, 
we're going to go, you know, get the ice cream with the friends. We're not doing it four times a week. We're doing it one time a week, you know? Um, and, uh, really making some courageous moves. Like I'll never forget. We had this family tradition of going on a vacation, um, during the holidays. And I wanted to be able to go with the rest of my family, but I, had to really be on a budget and saying to my parents, um, I know you like to go to these fancy restaurants and um, I don't expect you to pay for me. And so this is how it's going to go down. You know, I'm either not going to, we need to pick other places or we can cook. Um, and oh my gosh, I can remember <laughs> going to some of those places. Luckily my kids were little, so they could still eat kids meals. But I remember scanning the right side of the menu and being like, I really want sea bass so bad. <laughs> and then I'd be like, okay, I'm going to have like the appetizer, like, you know, salad or the appetizer this, because that's really enough. Mm -hmm. Right. And that allows me to be here and be connected and, you know, I'm getting enough food. <laughs> it's, right. And making decisions like that, that took a lot of courage to try and live in what I call the shade of gray and not be like victimized by my choice to be discerning with my money. Yeah. Just make choices. Yeah. And I, and I love, I, I love that word because it really, you, some, we do have to, it's not about coming from a place of scarcity. It's about being discerning with what is, what is the new version of me? What is, what is in my financial future look like, um, with intentionality. And that might require that I am now discerning. I'm making different choices that I would have made that would have been different a year ago or six months ago. I got really creative though. Like I learned how to do home exchanges. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I was like, I really want to travel. Like I want to take my kids on these trips. And so I got resourceful and I researched and I found this whole industry of home swapping. And I went and, and that ended that, that resourceful choice ended up creating incredible opportunities and memories and experiences for my family. This was long before people ever even rented Airbnb. Airbnb. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I, and my kids, we still have the best memories of all these home swaps we did all over the world. And so that creativity, that resourcefulness and creativity actually created amazing opportunities. And I'll tell you what, like I'm doing way better. My kids are now 26, 23 and 19, and I'm trying to teach them healthy relationship, mm -hmm. the money and, um, to be discerning. And it's hard because they have the same original dad. <laughs> 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 so I'm trying to balance both. Yeah. But you've modeled, uh, you've modeled it so well. I, I, I think, I, I think you, there's more in them that they've learned that you, than you giving yourself credit for. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do. And it, it, but it's interesting because, um, God, I could talk to you for this stuff about hours, but, but also then I had to, with the money thing, I had to like, I had to understand that if my ex-husband used money for love, right. And that's how he showed love. Um, and he lavished all these things on them and I couldn't, would they love me? Mm -hmm. I mean, that you said, like money is a, uh, a gift that will poke holes in so many things. And I love your show because you say like, turn toward it because it's like the holes are where there's the freedom. So yes. I'm, I yes. think it's just juicy. Yes. <laughs> Definitely, definitely juicy. And it's just so, so important. Um, let's talk about the idea for the new book that you've been working on. Um, it's a slight departure from your previous work. I say slight, but what was the impetus for this work? I know it has a lot to do perhaps with um, the loss of your father. Take us there. Um, well, so when my father was dying, um, you know, as as can happen when you get to a certain age, it was super unexpected. Um, but I remember in this, the book is about the last five days in the hospital and, but it's not like the sad story of like, you know, that grief, it's the story more of, um, coming to this realization, like this is a moment where I can surrender to what's happening and I can model how to, take what I've learned, what he taught me and the legacy that I want to leave 
and take what I want to keep and leave what I want to leave behind and celebrate the end of this person's life and model it not only for, you know, for myself, but for my, for my kids and how to, to do death well and uh, be present in that experience and, and be able to be conscious enough to, to be in choice about that. And, and what I really, um, ended up thinking about like all the values of, of that I want to keep, I was able to bring into those final days and honor my dad in that way. Um, and really leave a lot of it behind. And so, uh, it uses the framework of those seven questions um, about how I chose to create meaning in my life and honor the meaning in his life through how I showed up in the last five days. Mm. Remind us what those seven questions were again. Oh my gosh, all of them. You know what? Uh, I don't think I have them pulled up in front of me to be honest with you, but, um, but they're, they're really about, um, you know, did you have faith? Did you have hope? Mm -hmm. Um, and my favorite one is, you know, were you yourself? Yeah. You know, and that's, and that's really it. And and one of the things that I really grappled with, which I think is a huge issue challenge is what's that fine line between denial and hope, <laughs> mm. right? Like, when are you like hopeful and when are you in denial? You know, and I grew up with a, with a wealth of positivity and it was like, you know, an early reader of my book said, I don't know, this family seems like they're in denial. And I was in in early drafts of the book. And I was like, wait, no, but you don't understand my family. They weren't in denial. Um, We were really hopeful and we did really believe in positivity um, and intention. And then also there's surrender. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And that moment takes a freaking heck of a lot of courage. Yeah. Yeah. It does take a lot of courage to trust, to trust that there is a force above us that, that is looking out for our best. And, uh, we don't have to have all the answers and we certainly do not have to know the how we can be very clear on the why, but we certainly should not be in the how department. (laughs) Well, yeah. And I think I had this other, so I had a lot, a lot of spiritual experiences on my little 35 days on the road, but one was in the ancient redwood forest. And I, I am the girl who always reads the little brochure and the manual. And, um, you know, there's like, only so many of these ancient redwoods left, like not very many, right? Cause they're, yeah. they're like 2,300 years old. They're falling down. Um, and this, this thing I read said that that's not actually tragic. Like things have to die. Things have to end so that all those little trees can get life and one day become these giant redwoods. Right. And I had this moment, um, another spiritual experience where my, I heard my dad say, like, I had to go so that you could grow, that you could live who you're really meant to be. And, Mm. and and that's part of life. Right. Um, and it's, it's okay. Um, and, uh, I had met in the parking lot. I almost did like a triple take. My husband and I were like, there's a guy over there who looks exactly like your dad. Oh, and so I went up to him and I was like, I know this is so weird, but you look exactly like my dad. <laughs> uh, and then and that was in the parking lot. And then I walked in and then I got, had this, like, I, gra- I just had this message from my dad, like, you know, like it's, I, I had to go because you're ready to like, you know, you're ready to take it on and, and you can do this. Hmm. As you were um, embarking on your journey uh, as an entrepreneur, were they supportive, your parents? Well, my mom passed away before I even started. So she Mm -hmm. doesn't even know that money that, I mean, she knows because she's with me, but she wasn't here. Um, My dad, oh my God, he was so proud of me. Oh, that's so At first though, he was like old school because, you know, it was the beginning of the internet and I was writing all these blogs about my personal life and he was like, why are you putting all this stuff out on the internet? And I was like, I was like, well, that's what I'm doing. And I have no shame. I feel good about it. Um, so at first in early days, he was like, wow. Um, but no, he always thought what I did was cool. And he was very proud of me. That's so great. I love what you describe as the process of, you know, there, there's, there's so much that our parents have given us. And I always tell my students, like, when you understand the money stories and what you've learned, the legacy that you've 
you've been gifted from your parents, there's, there's going to be good. And there's going to be, listen, it's not about good or not good. There's going to be stuff that serves you. And there's going to be stuff that doesn't serve you. So now you as the adult can choose to focus on the things that serve you and honor your parents continuing that, and then let go of the stuff that doesn't serve you. It's okay. It's okay. You don't have to continue that. Because they don't, they, they don't want it. They don't want us to, you know, in my dad's like, la- like one of his last, like conscious moments, like, you know, he was mumbling about his credit card bill. Really? Yeah. And, uh, and that was like a huge takeaway for me. And I realized that my dad always felt like less than growing up in like great neck, New York around all these affluent people and like all his peers. And I realized that he always felt like less than, and he worked till literally the day he died. Um, and he was mumbling about these credit cards. And I just had that moment where I was like, that's a part I'm leaving. Yeah. Like, do you want to be on your deathbed worried about the balance on your credit card? No. Right. And that's what I talk about in the book is like who you are is how you are in your death. And on the flip side of that, you know, my dad, <laughs> Like one of the last things he said to me was like, I'll be surprised if this kills me, but I've been surprised. (laughs) (laughs) He was funny. He was hilarious and he was a jokester. And so like, there he was, you know, one moment mumbling about his credit cards and then in the other, just like making a joke. Right. Um, And so like, that's that moment. And you're like, all right, who do who do I want to be? What do I want to leave behind? And what do I want to take with me? Mm-hmm. Sounds like a great book. When is it coming out? We are, we, we just got an agent literally in the last week or so. And so we are just starting to put it out to publishers. And so we are super excited. Um, we're super excited about it. So uh, send us good vibes. Yes, certainly. Keep us posted. Keep us posted. And maybe you'll come back and we'll talk about the book in, in depth. Let's yes. do now what I call Jewish money matters fill in the blanks. And this okay. is part of the show, Marnie, where I'm going to give you an open ended statement and you finish it with the first thing that comes to mind. All right? I love these. I love games. Okay, go. <laughs> You're so fun. Okay. When I give to DACA charity, I'd like to give to Girl Now Foundation. Oh, nice all about empowering women. Very good. Yeah, young girls in Uganda. Very nice. Very nice. I'd like to make more money because I want to make more impact. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thank you for saying that because money does allow you to have <laughs> <an> impact. Yes. <laughs> Something I wish I'd learn about money growing up is doesn't buy you happiness. Mm-hmm. Money, spiritual or physical? Spiritual. Something I splurge on unapologetically is expensive travel experiences. Mm, Nice. Marnie, spender, saver, spender or saver? Middle. (laughs) 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 Like the great, my money that said, take the middle road, people. (laughs) I'm like, I am a saver. And now that I have some money, I do spend. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Today, I am most grateful for Um, Just abundance in all its forms Mm. as a reflection of really who I am. And finally, I'm Marnie Batista, and I believe Jewish money matters because. We need to change the story. Mm. Yeah. As a people and collectively, don't we? Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Very nice. Marnie, tell us where we can find you. How do we well, get in touch with you? Uh, tell us everything. You have a podcast also. We have a podcast called Life Check Yourself, mm-hmm. which is super fun. Um, you can find us at the Institute for Living Courageously, which is a really long thing to type in. So instead, you can just type in ilcvip.com. Nice. Very, very nice. And your work there is for both men and women, or is it focused on women? We work with women, but if, Mm -hmm. if there's a man who wants to do this work, we have coaches that can help you. Amazing. Keep up the great work. This was a great conversation. So much to learn here. And we'll also look, look up for your podcast and we'll put all of this in the show notes. Thank you so much. It was fun to be here. You're amazing. Thank you, Marnie. Okay. bye. Bye.